nano confined water in solid structures by oops okay by uh, more or less we are going to talk about two types of structures we are going to to talk about nano confined water in nanotubes and in nanopores Okay, the, the water you pass through the pores or the, the water you pass through the tubes. But just to review, we have been talking about water a lot, but in our first lecture on Monday, we present to you the water that have this fantastic V-shape, V-shape, and that forms uh, because they have uh, instantaneous presence of electrons in, in this area and in this area form the tetrahedral structure. This tetrahedral structure also because the hydrogens are electronless, they, most of the electrons are around the oxygen, so you, you make dipolar moments that lead to the formation of the hydrogen bonds, not one hydrogen bone, but four hydrogen bones striping uh, the molecule. So when you see the water molecules, you can see these two types of structures. One is structure in which the tetramers are linked by hydrogen bonds between them, and another one in which uh, they are unlinked. So most of the talks we hear here in which uh, we present the true structures of water, the low density water, the high density liquid water or, or amorphous phase, is all about this dancing of these two types of structures as you mentioned in your first lecture. In this lecture, I also show that this dancing, the presence of open structure that you be by this bounded tremors leads to the explanation why the heat capacity increases as you decrease the temperature. And usually, this enhancement of the heat capacity is what uh, Powell explained that you give rise to the widow line, that you'll be a peak in this at some point when it crosses the widow line, that's the line beyond the second potential second critical point, and that this uh, enhancement of the heat capacity is due to the fact that they can rewrite the heat capacity as the fluctuation of entropy. And when I see this picture, I see uh, an average high entropy, but a local low entropy, what makes the distinction between these two things, that's the fluctuations, enhance as I decrease the temperature, what explains the heat capacity increasement of water. Similarly, when I look to the compressibility that also is enhanced, that also you have a peak when you cross the widow line, uh, can also be explained uh, because the, heat, the compressibility is the fluctuation of volume, means the, local, the, the global volume minus the local volume, the average volume. And you can see the average volume is more compact because the average volume will be a mixture of these two types of structure, while the local volume will be only this structure that's an open structure. And with that, with my fingers, I can explain what's going on here. Then the mixture of these two things becomes the thermal, com the thermal coefficient. And because this is negative, we can have a thermal coefficient that's negative, what brings the uh, maximum of density, that's one of the most known water anomalies. Here again is the phase diagram. As you can see, you have the liquid gas critical point, and you can see a dotted line that will be the widow line. Here, I just have one single phase, but as I cross the widow line, I, I see effects uh, that you become a diversions at the critical point, and here is the supposed to be second critical point, and you can see the difference of slope because while in this phase I have a difference of volume accompanied by a difference of entropy having the same sign, and with that I have a positive slope. Here, when I increase the, vo I have an increasing volume in the difference of the phase, a decrease in entropy, and that's why I have this potential, because this was not seen, potential is low for the second critical point, 
and the we don't line will be something that goes beyond here and all the anomalies will be around this area. Well, now we're going to talk about something that also Paula discussed a lot, but now I'm going to first bring this diffusion, the mobility at the bulk level, just full water level. Here, just to remind you that I can calculate the diffusion coefficient by the radio distribution function, the, the position now and the position in a time t, and this will be the diffusion con constant. Another element that will be important for us is the correlation. I will put a vector in my molecule, and I'm going to calculate the time the molecule uh, rotates and the correlation for that. There's two quantities, diffusion constant and translational and uh, rotational uh, coefficient will be used uh, to understand some of the dynamics of bulk water first and then confined. Here just to, then another element that I'm going to use is the viscosity uh, that I calculate from uh, the stress tensor and the diffusion constant and the traditional expression which relates the diffusion constant, Stoke-Einstein, with uh, viscosity, okay? This is a very uh, traditional expression in which one goes with the inverse of the other. Please keep this in mind because we are going to test if this quantity is still true when I look to the confined water situation. So many years ago, Austin Angel did an experiment in which he measured the diffusion coefficient of, of, of water against pressure, and he observed that I have this region in which I decrease the pressure and the diffusion coefficient decreases. This is not, imagine, diffusion coefficient is the ability of moving. If you Increase the pressure, the idea is that you should decrease the ability of moving. So a, a more natural wait, a more natural behavior would be increasing pressure and decreasing the, the diffusion. I increase and I got stuck and I don't move. Okay? But what he observed is that I have a whole region in which I increase pressure and I increase the diffusion. And if you have very good eyes, you can see that around here there is a maximum of this function. And these circles are the maximum in density. Okay, so the maximum in density of water is kind of close by the maximum of diffusion water. So this is kind of puzzle. You know, I compress and water moves faster. Water have more mobility. So many, many years ago, I think some of you were not even born, uh, we did some molecular dynamic simulations with SPC water, uh, Grijera model, in which we measure the diffusion coefficients against density, that's kind of equivalent of thinking against pressure. So I increase the number of molecules in this area, in this area, in this area, and water moves faster, okay? So more molecules and somehow the water is moving faster. So att we attempted to understand what was going on uh, in this scenario. Pay attention that all this happens at very low temperatures, okay? So it's low temperatures, increase number of molecules, I increase. Unlike the experiments of ANGEL in the simulations, we have a minimum. Here, it never reaches, never goes up again, okay? So unlike his experiments, we are able to have a minimum. Uh, in this area, we are in negative pressures, and that's why he couldn't get there. But in simulations, we do some tricks, and you can get into this area. So you have a maximum, you have a minimum, you have a minimum, a maximum, and so so far. So this is just the comparison between the experiments and what you observe in this particular 
SPC type of model in which we find a region in, in, in which the diffusion uh, is anomalous. But also, we did something that was not done experimentally. We put a vector in our oxygen and have many plots because we put different vectors and they have ships, but they particularly don't give a very distinct uh, different behavior. And you calculate the time the molecule takes to rotate, okay? So we show that if you increase the density, water moves faster. But now I want to understand if while water moves faster, the water molecules won't also rotate faster, okay? The, the two things like a dance, okay? And what we show here is that this is time to rotate. So when this is big, means that rotating is lower, okay? So in the region in which water rotates slower is the same region in which I have the minimum of diffusion. And the region in which you have faster is the region where you have the maximum, around one. To show that in a very particular case, we do that. Here I have the two things. I have the diffusion and the, the translational, and they have tall, so when it's minimum, the other one is maximum. I just multiply by 400 to make the two plots in the same graph. And you can see that it's just two things, the rotation and the translation, they are related. And, uh, and they are related, and more than they are related, uh, there is a very beautiful paper by Stanley and collaborators in which they show that the molecules that are more fast rotating are the first neighbors of the molecules that are more fast diffusing. So it's not that water is doing this thing. The water is moving like this, but the neighbors are doing this. Okay, so it's, it's, it's like a um, catraca in a bus. The catraca is there, is doing this, and the people are moving uh, uh, from, I actually, when Jim showed me first time this result, I have to explain what a, I saw, that's a catraca, and what's a catraca? They didn't have that, you know, in the United States, but he found that was very peculiar thing. Okay. A second thing we found, and this is, is kind of shed some lights in, in the mechanism behind this movement, is that why water moves fast when it's more compact, okay? So what we calculate was the probability of water having four Ah, o que, que eu faço? Por, ah, por fora, espera aí. Assim? Tá. So, ok. E então, o que nós fizemos é que nós calculamos o número de primeiros neighbors que cada water molecule tem. Lembre-se, o water quer fazer quatro bonds. Então, o que é natural number of neighbors you could expect for water is to have four neighbors. So you make four bonds with four neighbors, okay? And so we calculate the probability of finding, and most of the water molecules were making four bonds in all the densities. It's very low temperature, so in all densities they are making four bonds. But when I increase the density, what we observe is that we have molecules that have, in the same proportion of having four neighbors, having five and six neighbors. And that the hydrogen bonds, even though present, they have a weakening energy, what means that each bond was a little bit weaker. 
This means that water was moving by moving from one hydrogen bond to another hydrogen bond. So water moves fast because the neighbors are close enough that the times we take uh, to calculate the hydrogen bonds uh, didn't take, couldn't measure the fact that instead of being bonded with this, was bonded, was moving from one bond to another. Okay, so water was moving from one bond to another when it was more compact. Okay, so this is an illustration of the, the, the phase diagram for the experiments in which you have the maximum diffusion, the maximum density, and here we could have the maximum diffusion, max, uh, maximum in density, minimum and minimum. So as I explained before, we could reach out something uh, the experience couldn't do, that is the negative pressure region. Okay, so because these two states for us were very interesting thing, you have two two ways in which water want to be uh, apart, the determiners apart, and the diplomas to get apart. We wonder if you could not explain all the water anomalies without the need to have the full water. Maybe only with part of the mechanism we could do that. You know, instead of having the water, we thought, what about if you make a tetramer to be the unit. Not having the oxygens, the hydrogens, but the tetramer are our basic simulation unit. Something like that. I have a sphere that's a tetramer. Okay. Is a sphere that is a tetramer with the correct potential would be able to reproduce the water anomalies. Maybe not with the right numbers, but with the phenomenology. See, if it, all the anomalies are related to this bound and this bound by, by the two states, maybe if I have a single, a particle represented the tremors, I would be able to represent the anomalies. So what we use to go from here to here is to use the radio distribution function illustrated by that, which we have seen in many of the talks, the descriptions of how to calculate this. But we start with this. This will be the, you take a, a radio distribution, oxygen, oxygen, radio distribution function of a simulation of one model. In this particular case, the model was called ST4. You take this. Okay, so you have this information because you, you got it from one single simulation. Then you go to Orsteizenic equation in which you have the G of R for here. You get the H of R and the potential you come from the combination of this and the solution of this. Okay, so I can derive a potential between two tetramers by the radio distribution function of one simulation for one specific model. You might be thinking you, you select one density on temperature and you hope this will describe everything. Yes, that's the name of the game. With that, we generate this type of potential, okay, two length scale potential. We have a shoulder, uh, uh, this yellow line is the force, so the shoulder represents the uh, non hydrogen bonding tetramers, and the hydrogen bond tetramers will be here. Okay? But now the simulation will not have more oxygens, will have no hydrogens, there will be spheres in a box interacting to two length scales potential. And it's very useful because then you can understand if the basic idea you had about the anomalies come from these two uh, length scales direction, if it's true or not. Because then a simple sphere with two length scale interaction will have at least some of the anomalies present in liquid water. 
So we did the simulations. The gray lines are isocores. So at each time you have a minimum in the isocores means that you have a temperature of maximum density. So yes, we have a whole region in the phase diagram in which you have a temperature of maximum density. So this model, two length scales, reproduce this water uh, anomaly of density. But also we calculate the diffusion coefficient. And you can see that the diffusion coefficient have a maximum and have a minimum, exactly like we observe in our full simulations. And we are representing this maximum and this mi the maximum and the minimum here as this green and this green. And you also calculate the rotational that is this other ones. And in this particular model, because there is no homogeneous nucleation, we have a second critical point, like the second critical point that people have discussed for water that you separate two liquid phases for water. Okay, so yes, the answer is yes. It's possible to have at least some of the anomalies of water in a model that's an effective model. It's not a full model, it's an effective model for water. And here's just putting together experiments, atomistic simulations, and effective model uh, for water. Then, if I can do this model for, uh, use this effective model for the description of uh, bulk water, why not using it for confining water? Okay, so now we are going to ask ourselves what happens with that same diffusion coefficient that we found that have this anomalous behavior in confining water. So to do that, what we did is that we have uh, two reservoirs, one and two, and you have a nanotube linking these two reservoirs. We keep the same density in the two sides, and we see what happens with the diffusion inside this tube. Again, the potential will be this two-leg scale potential in which the sides can present the interactions of non-bonded tetramers and here with bonded tetramers. So what we, you got from, from this work is that as you cut here, what you're seeing is, is a nanotube that you look in front of the nanotube and you did a cut. So when this nanotube is large, you can see four main layers. The red things, this is the nanotube. This is the water is in red, okay? I'm just showing, and they are just spheres because I don't have the oxygen. As I decrease the radius of the nanotube, you're going to see that the layering becomes more and more consistent and that the number of layers decrease until you have just one single line. Okay. This single line is not a single line of water molecules because each sphere here does not represent one water molecule but a tetramer, so it's, it's a larger structure. But what you see is that there is this formation of layering of the tetramers. And this gives rise to a diffusion constant that as you decrease the radius, like you are decreasing here, you decrease the, the radius of the nanotube until the smaller radius, you observe that you, the diffusion coefficient goes down the system almost freezes, and then it skis a little bit more, and it diffuses again. And this is an anomalous behavior, because what you expect as you decrease the size of a nanotube is that the water is going to move and stop moving. It does so and freezes, but then it squeezes a little bit more, and you just flow in this single line in this structure, okay? That's what this graph represents. 
And atomistic simulations also shows the same behavior. This is a simulation not for the effective model, but a, a, a simulation in which these numbers are armchair type of nanotubes, in which you, sh you see that there is a decrease in the diffusion coefficient, but when you come to this is smaller size of the nanotubes, you have an increase again. So you squeeze, it is kind of diffuse less, diffuse less, but then you decrease a little bit and you start to, diff to diffuse again. Just after again, please notice that at 9.9, I have a freezing. So water freezes at room temperature inside this armchair type of nanotube. Then we ask ourselves, uh, if all that with nanotubes depends of the type of nanotube you're using, okay? Because this freezing is, is, means that my water is ordering inside the nanotube, and, and if it's ordering, it also has to co compensate the, sorry to say, hydrophobic <laughs> interactions with the nanotube wall. So what we did next was now to, now we go atomistic because I need details. When I need details, I don't use effective models. I go atomistic. And we compare the diffusion coefficient with these two types of nanotube. Because you made the nanotube by wrapping up the graphene, and you can wrap it up in different ways. So we can have this structure or, or this structure. And you can see that they are distinct because I put in red here the distinction. And imagine that water you be willing to be in the center of this hexagonal. And here you'll be in one type of position, and here you'll be in another type of position. Okay? So this, these are the structures we analyzed, just uh, some examples of 99 uh, means this is a one type of structure. You're seeing that it, it's very small. The diameter is 1.22 nano, nanometers or 0.63. Then 16, this is another type of nanotube. This is the zigzag nanotube. This is our army share nanotube. So this is bigger than this, and this one is bigger than this. But these two have very similar uh, radius, this is uh, the, the, the size, the number of water molecules, and the densities we are working with. Here against the diffusion, against uh, the diameter, and remember we had something before that was something like this, you decrease and increase, and dec decrease and increase. But pay attention that this is a simulation done with an uh, uh, armchair uh, nanotube, and now we are comparing the armchair with the zigzag. And the first thing you will observe is that when you look front, cut your nanotube and look in front, and if you make the oxygens in red, uh, you can see where the oxygens are in both the zigzag nanotubes, the armchair nanotubes, okay? So when you look to the zigzag nanotubes, you can see that the oxygens are favoritely along lines inside the nanotube because you see the reddish either here, 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 here. Means that they are lining up in a very specific line. But when you look to the 99 nanotube, you're going to see that you see oxygens everywhere. And you see oxygens everywhere, not because they are lining in a circle, but because they are doing a helix. You know, the, the water needs to organize making hydrogen bonds. They are doing a single, uh, single line, so there is one line of uh, water molecules, but instead of, being a line in which they are lining 
in one after the other, they are doing a helix here. So here is a helix. They are the, here they are organizing in one line in each way. Notice that when I have a larger diameter, there is no distinction between the diffusion constant of the two, the, the two systems, the zigzag and, and the armchair. And you should notice that they form two layers, one central layer and outside layer, central layer, outside layer. But when, when I make it very, very small, we form one basic layer. And when I, but the huge difference is when I have the freezy for the armchair because the zigzag doesn't freeze. They don't freeze because the type of ordering that has inside. So when I go confined, yes, it's very important all the details about the confinement. There is, I cannot, I change the material, I will change important properties, maybe not for large or very small diameters, but surely the freezing point will be affected by that. Then also we start to ask ourselves if uh, Stokinstein relations would be still valid in that, uh, in that scenario. It might be you're asking that because Stokinstein relations was very important, everybody just remind you what I'm talking about. Is the relation between the diffusion and viscosity that was for classical hydrodynamics, this is, this is a kind of holy gale for classical hydrodynamics, if this would be valid in this situation in which we are confined at nanometer, in which I cannot make any type of approximations that were done to derive this expression, okay? So let's ask ourselves, and if you mind, Paola talk a little bit about that, and these have uh, approximations that is a uniform media, and here's not a uniform media because water is discretized, so in principle I have no hope to, to have that as, as valid. Uh, and we are going to do that comparing two types of system. We are going to compare a, a hydrophobic, hydrophilic system with hydrophobic system, okay? And for us, the hydrophobic and hydrophilic will be matched by an interaction parameter. So we are going to put an interaction parameter that you say is attractive or is repellent. So we're doing a tube, and you'll be water inside the tube against this type of structure. And you are going to look here only armchair. So we have the, and you select uh, uh, one larger diameter, medium, and very tiny diameter. And these are the, the details about what we did here. And we are calculating two things here. We are calculating the viscosity, remember, the expression for the viscosity, and we are checking if this is valid. So we are calculating the viscosity and the diffusion cost coefficient for two types of system in which you match the interaction between the confining wall and the water, means the the carbon that will not be carbon if I make hydrophilic, but the confining material with water, we kind of two, two different interactions, and we ask ourselves, what does change in the diffusion coefficient of water as you tune this parameter? If the wall loves me, how I move, if the walls hate me, how I move, and how this is connected with the, uh, with the, the diffusion versus viscosity for different uh, densities in my system, okay? So, 
As you can see, and here in blue, you'll be hydrophobic, in red, if you be hydrophilic. So I do expect uh, some distinction for the different uh, behaviors, but when I have a very large tube, the 3030, as you can see here, is four nanometer diameter tube, uh, I have both for hydrophobic, hydrophilic, no distinction, and more or less, uh, the, the enhancement, the increase of the diffusion implies a decrease of the, uh, the increase of the viscosity implies a decrease in the diffusion, not exactly in the same way as the equation, but it's not too dis different. Then I decrease a little bit the size of my nanotube, as I observed with 2.70 uh, nanometers of diameter. And again, I have the same thing for hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So for medium-sized nanotube, I see no distinction. And more or less, if this increase, this decrease. The change and the difference in behavior comes from when I compare the hydrophobic and hydrophilic for this very narrow tube that's 1010, in which you observe a huge increase in, in viscosity for the hydrophobic. So something in the structure that somehow was very similar when they have the 3030 and 1616 changed. And more than that, when I look to the diffusion for the hydrophobic, is like a change in the density. I make the system more compact, and the diffusion coefficient stays constant. And here I have a clear violation of stochastic. You know, it stay constant. Then we decide to look to this and ask ourselves, how are the molecules arranged inside the nanotubes uh, for these two cases, the hydrophobic and hydrophilic for 10, 10. And that's the distinction, you know. Uh, here I'm calculating also the number of hydrogen bonds. This is the hydrogen bonds, of course, of water in the case of hydrophobic and the case of hydrophilic uh, interactions. And they are very different as I increase uh, the density. And the structure in both cases is very, we have much more organization in the system when I have this hydrophilic size. And these organizations is what uh, make uh, all this distinction in the behavior. Here you have a more uh, compact, kind of messy, what means that allow me to have more hydrogen bonds because it's like the water is organizing in a smaller circle because it's kind of trying to be away from this surface area that is hydrophobic and with that it gets more disorganized. Here is attempt to be closer to the surface area what impose more organization but what also decrease the hydrogen bonds because it's pushing molecules more far apart. And flow, okay? First I talk about diffusion, that's this, but then let's ask ourselves what happens with the flow of molecules inside this nanotube. Uh, uh, to understand what I'm going to measure, uh, first uh, we have a relation that average velocity in the direction of the flow is related to the different in pressure between the two sides, the length of the tube with this hydrostatic parameter, okay? So this is a classical hydrodynamic type of equation, okay? And this expression is related to the diameter and to the, to the tube and to the viscosity. And the viscosity I can get from hydrodynamics, bulk hydrodynamics. So classically, I would expect to have these derived from these 
derived from this viscosity. So this is the classical linkage. But when I do simulations, I can direct calculate the average velocity. Okay, so I can calculate this, I know this, and I know this. So I kind of calculate this from the simulations. So I have the hydrodynamic path in which I get this hydrodynamic factor by the tube diameter and viscosity, and viscosity coming from the diffusion. And I have these calculated from measuring the velocity, having the difference in pressure and length, so I get that. So I define a factor that is the ratio of the simulation with the with the what is predicted by hydrodynamic equations. So if hydrodynamic would be valid in this highly confined system, this epsilon should be one. Okay? But you did you did this before doing the calculation, this is the value observed by the experiments. Okay, this is for two different temperatures. So it goes up, down, and up again. And you can see that it's very far away from one and that it actually depends on the diameter. Okay, so it is occasionally is to go into one very occasionally when you make it very, very big, the, the diameter of the tube, but what observe it is go up, down, and up again, okay? And here's the velocity that have the same shape, the ve particle's velocity uh, have the same shape. So what it did is that, again, we have a reservoir, you have a reservoir, and we are going to allow particles to flow from one reservoir to another reservoir by, by changing the density or enhancing the pressure in one side, pushing particles, so particles are going to flow with the, we know length, we know the difference in pressure, so we can calculate the uh, parameter gamma, and with that, we can calculate the epsilon. Again, here, for easy, we are going to use the effective model, so we are going to have water that have these two length scales. And what you observe again, as, as you cut the tube in the system, you have a formation of layering until you have one single layer of molecules. So this is the simulation box, high density here, low density, pressure imposing the particles to move from one side to another side. And this is the, the, the enhancement flow. Here I'm matching for different types of parameters that I can use in my potential, depending how I do the, the integral equation translation for the potential. But in all the cases, what I have is this up, down and up again, with numbers that are not so large as the observed by the experiments, but all much larger than one, what explains the, the fact that the hydrodynamic equations are not valid anymore in this regime. Okay. The hump. Uh, and then uh, what I'm showing here is that actually we understand the kink. Remember that in the experimental, there is this kink. Goes up, down, and up again. And here we see that this kink is related to the region in which you have two layers changing in one single layer. So there is this abrupt enhancement because the tetramers, remember each particle here is not one atom molecule, is a tetramer, they form the single line that flows from here, okay? Here just to illustrate the experimental results and the simulation results with a model that, again, is an effective model, so a bit far from 
from more realistic, but it already captures that the hydro hydrodynamic equations are not valid anymore in this regime. Here, just to show enhancement factor for many other world works in which they use atomistic uh, modeling and some of them already reaching out uh, many orders of magnitude beyond one. Then we ask ourselves, if water flows so fast inside nanotubes, why not look into nanopores? Instead of a tube, what happens if now I make a little pore and I flow water through this nanopore? Uh, one of the ideas behind this is to make filters. Uh, when you have a filter, you, you have a pressure that pu pushes uh, water to the other side of the membrane, and, and this water uh, leaves salts behind, and the water passes. Okay? This is a very expensive type of procedure because it requires a lot of pressure for making water to pass. And one of the properties people look at are very good quality membranes, membranes that allow water to pass and do not allow salt to pass. Okay? So we, this is something. So it would be nice to have something that water flows fast, like the nanotubes. Water flow fast in the nanotubes may be in a nanopore, because if I want to make a membrane, I have to make pores, it will flow. This is just to give an idea about the salination plants, how huge they are, because they need to pass many times uh, the water to the filters, and also because we require lots of energy. So what's the designing system we had? We have, again, two reservoirs, and we have a membrane, between the two reservoirs, and I have a single pore. The, in this case, we are using atomistic models for water and atomistic models for salt because uh, it's not possible to use effective models if I have charges on it, that is the salt. So we develop specific models for water and salt that give the correct hydrodialectic constant because dialectic constant is important if you have salt. And so water is pushed through the membrane. And here we ask ourselves how the size of the pore matters and how the charge of the membrane matters. Not the membrane is having any free charges, but the membrane have a charge distribution. Here we are using uh, molybdenum disulfate, uh, but in principle, we could be using other systems that have different types of charge distributions, and we ask ourselves which charge distribution would be best for having water flowing, and what the size of the pore that's the best what, uh, size for the pore. Okay, two important things, size and charge. Here we are illustrating to three different pore size, and for here down, three different charge distributions. The disulfate is the central one, okay? This is a fake disulfate, is a, a disulfate that have no charge, no distribution of charge, it like be uh, structure of the sulfate, but it will be graphene because have no charge distribution. And here is the disulfate with the double of charge, just to understand only the effect of charge. And this is uh, 0.74 nanometer of diameter, 0 0.97, uh, and 1.33 nanometers. And this is zero charge, one charge, two charge. More blue and more red means more oxygen, okay? Darker, no oxygen, no water. So you can see that in this smaller type of pore with no charge, all the, the water molecules are in the center of the pore. As you make it larger, it forms a circle, 
And if you make large as you form two, a center with two circles. So water is always attempting to keep the hydrogen bonds, and for that, it's going to layer, form layers. Here, you see, it's the same size as this one, but because I have charges in the pore, you know, it's not that I have extra charge. I have charge distributions. I have two sulfates outside, a molybdenum inside that have plus two charge. We, you can see that water molecules are kind of push towards the boundaries. And you can see that here it was a circle, but here is not a circle because it's trying, the water molecules is trying, you know, to go towards the charge. And here you can see that there's distortions, more localized water again because it's going to go to the towards the charge. Here is double, so the effect becomes even bigger than here. Here you can see that it's bigger because instead of being blue, already is red, but means a lot of oxygen here. And here, the same case. So you can also identify where the molybdenums are because of this pushing of the charge. So you see that charge already create a distribution, and that the charge distribution on the surface, okay? So this is the filtered water molecules against time for this, this size, 0.74, and, and three different uh, charges. Remember, this is a fake molybdenum, real molybdenum, and double charge molybdenum, okay? This will be more like graphene, and this will be a material very with strong charge distribution. And you can see that in this size, the best way to filter the charge is to use this distribution with zero charge that will be equivalent to a graphene. That's exactly that. So all the charges in the center lining up, exactly like we saw in the carbon nanotubes, the molecules lining up and they flow better because they are lining up. When they start to distribute then, they get more stuck like I observe in these two cases here. When they increase the size, you see that the size distribution leads to the formation of the rings, okay? This type of things. And these two structures, even though they look very unsimilar, they have a very similar type of behavioral number of particles filter. Because means that instead of being a single line, I distribute in, in, in different areas. But the excess of charge, the Q2, make charges just get stuck here. They are too, you know, too much charge in the wall means that they are going to be stuck in the wall. And they you have more difficult to pass. They you enter to the pore and they are so happy in the pore because of the charge of the wall. So in this particular case, these two ones are the best ones. And finally, when I make very large, doesn't matter. You know, the, the, the wall matters only with a, a smaller uh, diameter. No, doesn't matter for the diameter. And I didn't brought here, but for the salt rejection, that's also important. The best size is this size here. For some reason, I forgot to put the slide. So for the salt rejection, these two cases are the best ones. What means that using uh, molybdenum is a good option for making filters uh, as well as uh, graphene. Then we ask ourselves, if you want to make a filter, you want to put more than one pore, and what might happen is that you get turbulence in the entrance of the pore, and this might be bad for the filtration, okay? So what we did is that we asked ourselves, is there a difference between two pores isolated, this pore and another pore far away, this pore close or this pore a little bit further? 
in the sense of number of water molecules that pass. Because imagine there is two doors, and if you have a lot of people coming to two doors, you might have a confusion and they will not enter. So we ask ourselves, is this happen? This might happen here or not, okay? And now you are going to calculate the permeability. You appear as permeability before you're just counting the numbers uh, of, um, of water passed, but now we're going to calculate the volume of water per area and per time, uh, per pressure, and this will be the permeability. So here is the permeability of the one nanopore, that's one, and these two are the two other one nanopore. So the two nanopores either very close or far apart, doesn't matter. They, you don't see, you, you can notice that they have less than a pore diameter between them. And really doesn't matter when I compare with too far apart. We, we get the same behavior for astonishing huge pressures. This, these pressures are much higher than the pressure. The pressure you have in a desalination plant is something around here. Okay, but use huge pressures to have more statistics. And this huge pressures really doesn't matter. The water is going to enter in the same way. Of course, the one pore is lower because it's just one pore. So what it did, we renormalize one pore, and you can see the one pore, two pores make, you know, I multiply one pore by two and give absolutely the same thing. And the reason why it does not make different is because water align before getting into the nanopore. So it's like when you go to do some business in a bank or whatever, and we have this many slots, and all people are lining before the slots. Okay, so water, because of the hydrogen bonds, they will line before getting into the port. So that's our main conclusion. Uh, then we thought, well, but if I can get so good results for nanopores, why not making a nanotube of nanopores? It would be even better, you know, we put one nanotube, a nanopore after the water, and you make what? A tube, okay? Sounds brilliant, but it's not. Uh, what it is that you pile molybdenum disulfate, like that, you know, one after the water, you put pressure to see water. And what you observe is what's quite disappointing. Because you understand, I, because of the structure of the nano sheets, you don't match. It's not like you are piling pieces of paper. They have structure. And because they have structure, as you pass through this tube. Red means that we have oxygens, so it enters here, but then there is the interface of one to the other, and so the water enters, kind of get trapped, enter, get trapped. So because we have this little defects, they are not very big, but they are enough to generate stress when you pass from one layer to another, that you observe this uh, behavior, difference in behavior in the permeability, in which you have the permeability of six layers much lower than the permeability of a single layer. Okay? The good thing about being able to, to pile is that you get a more rigid structure, and more rigid structure is better to make a filter, you know. Otherwise, I have to say, I take one layer of molecules and make a filter for that, okay? And that's it for today. Next class, you're not, we are going to talk about nano-confined water in biology. Questions?
Yes, uh, make a tube from a disulfate molybdenum. This was done, I think Mateus did a, a diffusion or flow. But this will fit more libid than you? So have a fast flow also. But always there is an energy barrier to enter, to enter graphene, to enter nano, all the nanotubes, there's a huge barrier. You have to put inside, and then when it's inside, you have a huge flow. It doesn't have a huge flow to, to enter inside. But my doubt would be because they have uh, charges uh, in, the, in this, this charge distribution, if it's too small, it might get stuck in the charge distribution. Yeah. So it's good to 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 keep salt inside. Yeah, maybe. I spawn for salt, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I didn't show, but the rejection is in a, a balance. The, the, the problems in, in the rejection is that when you make too large, the salt enters, okay? But for, and if you make too small, the salt gets stuck. It's attracted and it gets stuck. So you need to average the same in between size to enter, uh, to the water enter and the, the salt uh, to be rejected. Okay, so this uh, one nanometer diameter is the best diameter for this. Yes, have to pass completely. That's why you need a huge pressure. You know, yeah. the pressures that the, the desalination plants use are huge. And we can get one order the magnitude lower, but still are huge pressures because you have to de de make the ions. Yeah. If you do what? If you the pore. Attach. But then, then the water will not pass because you have to occupy this. The problem is that you cannot, the, 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 if the salt approach is a problem because it's going to block the entrance. So it's, it's, it's subtle. There is a, the perfect uh, balance between uh, those things for, for desalination. Now we are attempting, and Rogelme is going to, to speak a little bit tomorrow about this, we are attempting to do stripes instead of pores, stripes, because there is an experimental, no, it's not experimental, actually uh, applied group in Minas. They, they show that if you take a, a polymer membrane, because those desalinations are polymer membranes, and you put a surface of uh, graphene oxide on top, you cover with that, the process of filtering is better. What means that you add two things and the filter filters better than just one thing. And what we suspect is that the oxygraphene orders the water. When you have a polymer, 
there is no, it's a disorder system, but the, the, the graphene is ordered. So the water you enter order to this. So you are analyzing, but when they cover, they don't have pores. They have defects in covering that will be stripes. Perguntas? No? Então, 